So after today, in this series entitled Real Church, there are two more lessons, and um, And we'll start a new series in August. But um, Today we're going to deal with real giving. And uh, we're going to look here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. So we've talked about uh, real faith. We've talked about real relationships, real worship. Um, I think we have one coming up on real missions. And... Um, <clears throat> Real prayer. We did one on real prayer. Um, and again, today we'll do real giving. So let's read uh, 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 8, uh, 1 through 14, and then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into today's lesson. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints." And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather and to open up your word, both in the Sunday school hour and the morning worship service. We ask and pray, Lord, your blessing on our time together. Speak to our hearts. Uh, by your word, uh, by your spirit, draw each of us closer to you. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with the Sunday school classes downstairs, that you'd bless what's taking place there, speak to the hearts of the students, and use each teacher. Thank you again for your love and your mercy and for your grace. Thank you for who you are, and uh, thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Help me as I teach this lesson this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, real giving. Introductory statement. <clears throat> the giving and generosity of believers in the New Testament was passionate and sacrificial. Only the grace of God can move our hearts to give in this way. And perhaps one of the most rigorous tests of authenticity in the local church is our financial giving and the heart from which we give. So you notice in the text, look at verse 3, if you will. It said, as Paul wrote to them, For to their power, and I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So the church in Corinth was in, in Greece, in Macedonia. And at this particular time, and this is about 30 or so years after Jesus died, was buried, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And so uh, as the church had um, 
had been persecuted in Jerusalem, and then it, was, it began to spread throughout that region. Uh, this particular area of, of where they were uh, establishing this church, and the early Christians, they were under and faced intense persecution. Now, uh, this is difficult because they were going against, um, uh, although this church was primarily made up of Gentiles, there was still um, the Jewish uh, opposition, there was the Roman opposition, there was the labor unions that were opposed because they were all tied into idolatry. And so it was a difficult time. These Christians were not having an easy time of it at all. And then in addition to that, they were not well off. They, they weren't a wealthy people by any means. And Paul would commend them when he wrote to the church in Philippi. They were one of the few churches that supported or continued to support Paul's ministry as he went on missionary journey after missionary journey. But he writes to them here, and really the context of this particular chapter is not necessarily uh, local church giving in the sense of supporting the local church, although there are a lot of lessons to be learned from it. Uh, the finances that he's talking about here, there was an offering that was being received and they had promised to receive this offering a year prior. You'll see that as we get into the text. And to send this money to Jerusalem, where believers in Jerusalem were going even through more persecution than they were. It was kind of like what we would call a relief offering. Um, and they hadn't fulfilled uh, their promise with regards to what they were doing. So Paul writes to them about this. But on your handout, I forget who said this, but somebody once said this, that giving and our giving is not a debt that you owe, but it's a seed that you sow. It's really like, it's an investment. We'll talk about that with regards to our financial giving. And in the introductory statement, we talked about authenticity in the local church and authenticity in believers. You know, Jesus would say in the Gospels, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. And financial giving, really, I do believe it's an indication of a person's heart with regards to uh, their relationship with the Lord. Um, and so let's kind of get into this here and see what we can learn from the believers here in Corinth and the letter that Paul writes to them. So our first point, you notice on the handout, is they had a passion. These people who were facing intense persecution and intense poverty, they were passionate about giving. Um, and you and I, when, when we think about giving and what we can do financially, um, this passion that they had and the passion that you and I have, it really, it comes from the Lord. It's, it's about grace in our lives. Um, and so the sub-point here, it was developed, this passion, by God's grace. Look again at verses 1 through 4. So Paul writes, he says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So these churches in that area, God was blessing them. And then he commends them. How that in this great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality, the, the, the trial and the poverty they were in, yet they were giving. And Paul is, is, is using the, the, these churches of Macedonia to, uh, as an example. And he says, and he's teaching the Corinthians through them. He says, for to their power I bear you record beyond their power. They were willing of, of themselves. Um, so you notice here, um, how it says that God bestowed on the churches. Verse 1, he bestowed on the churches. He supplied or he furnished. He created a disposition in their heart that they had a desire to give. And that's a desire that you and I need to cultivate in our hearts as well. Look down at verse 7 of the text. Therefore, Paul says, as you abound in everything... Faith, uh, utterance, that's, that's uh, communicating the gospel clearly and intelligently. Uh, 
knowledge, learning about the things of God, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, will see that you abound in this grace also. Well, what grace is that? That's the grace of giving, financial giving. And um, he reminds them of that. Look over in chapter 9 in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Again, it's part of the grace of God that's working uh, in our lives. And he just continues to encourage them with regards to this idea about giving and giving financially. In, the, in Mark chapter 12, you notice on your hand of verse 44, it says here, this is an, an instance where they're, they're at the temple and there are those that are putting in their offerings and some are putting in more, others less. And it says, for all they, for, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even her living. You remember she put in her two mites. That's all this woman had. She gave her all to it. And um, because she had given herself to the Lord. And really that's what financial giving is about. It's about giving yourself to the Lord. It's not so much about giving your money to the Lord's work. It's about giving yourself to the Lord. To be a living sacrifice. To be used of the Lord in any way the Lord sees fit to use you. And the church of churches of Macedonia, they understood that. The church in Corinth, they needed to learn that. And it's interesting, too, because of all of Paul's epistles, the church in Corinth was the most carnal of all the churches. They were the most fleshly. And uh, there's so many things that had to be corrected in those churches. And, and, and Paul said to them, you know, you made this promise, but you haven't fulfilled the promise. It's easier to say, I love Jesus, but how do you then show it? There's numbers of ways, and one of the ways is by sacrificially giving. Um, and so, again, Paul, he's, he's, he's bringing this point across to them here. Um, look at verse 7 of chapter 9. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart... So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And then again, we already read verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. So, as Paul writes this, you know, one of the things that we need to be careful of, we don't want people to give out of guilt. Why, why, what happens, what can happen to someone's heart if they begin to give financially out of guilt? Okay, what, 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 what's the ramification of that after a period? Because you can motivate people to give by guilt. You really can. But what, what, if you continue to kind of drive that home, uh, what might happen in somebody's heart? It's hard. Huh? It gets hard. Yeah, it gets hard. Or it gets bitter. And uh, so that's the wrong motivation. I was... I was at a youth meeting once, and they took up an offering, and uh, I was kind of perturbed by this, and I'm, I, I believe in giving, but uh, this guy got up, and he was really trying to raise money, and he said, somebody here, you've got a $20 bill in your pocket, and uh, you know that's the Lord's, and I got to thinking, there's a lot of people here with a $20 bill in their pocket, and he, and he was trying to manipulate um, so we, you don't want to be manipulated by man, but you want to be motivated by the Holy Spirit of God. Um, and, and I can give you other examples as well. So yeah, guilt can cause a bitterness uh, in your heart with regards to giving. And then some people, this might sound odd, but some people can give um, with a, a, like a greedy motivation. What do I mean by that? Because that doesn't really sound like you're giving, you're giving, uh, you're giving, but how does that, you know, you're giving away, you're not taking in. But how would, go ahead, Jim Atherton. Well, it would be giving with a greedy 
motivation, you're thinking that you're going to get something back. Yeah, you think you're going to get something back. You're expecting, you're expect, almost like if I give, if, and you see, this is also used in, in motivational, uh, you see this a lot on TV with televangelists. If you'll give, you know, you'll get this back, and it'll be tenfold, and, and uh, I don't know, I, I, I personally, I, I, whether, now, now the Bible does say, and it's, in fact, it's on your hand out here, uh, where is it? Uh, it look, look in the back of your handout. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 on your handout. So in the, in the book of Malachi, the Bible says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that ye, there may be meat in mine house, and prove me. That word prove means test me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open ye, the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So there is the whole there is the whole Bible example of sowing and reaping, but no one gives financially to the Lord's work with the motivation that you're going to get rich, right? I mean that's 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 not why you you give. So anyhow, um, we're talking about the grace of God, and um, then we find here that it was demonstrated by, by God's people. So again, on the back of your, your handout, look what it says in verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. So they had willing hearts with regards to giving. And um, one of the great examples of this, if you go to the Old Testament, to the book of First Chronicles, take your Bibles and go to First Chronicles in the Old Testament. First Chronicles chapter number 29. First Chronicles 29. So chapter 29 is, um, well actually in chapter, in chapter, go to chapter 28 first, verse 1. And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and of the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, the captains over the hundreds, the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king, and of his sons, with the officers, and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men, unto Jerusalem. And the king stood upon his feet, and he said, Hear me, my brethren, and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest, for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God, and made ready for the building. So let me just stop here. So anyhow, up until this point, there's the tabernacle, and he's going to build the temple. And, but God said to David, you're not going to build the temple because you're a man of bloodshed, but Solomon, he'll build the temple. And so, um, but David is allowed to gather all the material that's necessary to build the temple. So, Look at verse 9 of chapter 28. And thou, Solomon, my son, know that the Lord God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth the imagination of the thoughts. So in other words, the Lord knows the heart. Now go to chapter 29. So they begin to collect all of that's needed, and they get all the instruction in verse 28 with regards to what the tabernacle is going to be like. And if you read through that, you'd see all of these things listed. So, so anyhow, the need is presented to them there and to the people of Israel. And so they see what the need is. And then the very end of chapter 1 of verse 29 David says this, he says, For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. In other words, we're building this temple, but ultimately the temple is not for mankind. The temple is for um, the Lord, to honor the Lord. And so really the local church, while we gather here and we benefit from it, we're here to glorify God. And then, so they begin to collect all of these things. Then in verse 6, it says, Then the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the rulers of the king's work, they offered, it says, willingly. They began as a people to willingly bring all that was needed. Then look at verse 9. Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly 
because with a perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And then in verse 14, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? And then in verse 17, right about the middle of the verse, As for me and the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all of these things. So in other words, there was a willingness that, that, they, that they had. And you go back to 1 Corinthians. So that was what was demonstrated, or Paul was demonstrating um, to the church in Corinth with regards to the churches of Macedonia, that these people were willing. They didn't have to be guilted into it. They, they didn't have to uh, be motivated. It was the grace of God that was motivating them uh, to give. And um, that we, we looked at the woman there who gave her two mites. It was, it was the grace of God and her, and her love for the Lord Jesus Christ that was motivating her uh, to do that. So their passion for giving was developed by God's grace, and their passion for giving was demonstrated uh, by the churches there in, in Macedonia. They had willing hearts. They had ministering hearts. In fact, look at verse 4 of the text. Uh, look at the very end of it. When Paul writes this, he says that these churches, they wanted to take upon themselves the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. It's like when we give to missions. There's a fellowship with regards to that. Uh, I was talking with my friend Bruce Patterson, who um, was at, I was at a preacher's meeting on Friday, and he's going back to the Philippines next year. Um, so he's going to actually come for our missions conference. And he was... Uh, uh, supposed to go when COVID hit and they were bringing Bibles to the Philippines and then they had to postpone the trip and they finally went. But he's going to go again next year, Lord willing. So he's going to come in November when we have our conference and uh, he's going to report back on his last trip and he's trying to make raise money to buy Bibles for his next trip. Um, so there's a, and, and we helped. I think we gave, if I remember correctly, $1,500 or, or so towards purchasing Bibles. So we were part of that fellowship of ministering to the saints. And we were able to do that because of your willingness to give and because you had a sacrificial heart to give. Um, and you demonstrated that. And so that's what the churches there in Macedonia were doing. And Paul's teaching them the here in Corinth. Listen, learn from the Macedonians and their example. They made an investment in eternity. And when we give, we make an investment, whether it's overseas or whether it's here, we're making an investment in eternity. So when, this, the, when someone says, giving is not a debt you owe, but a seed you sow, that's what they mean. You're making an investment. Camp is coming up. And through the years, people in our church have sponsored children to go to camp. And some of these children that go to camp, they, they don't, they've never heard the gospel before. Or some of them have but haven't gotten saved. And they go to camp and they receive Christ as their Savior. So to make that happen, there have been people who have given financially. And because they gave financially for the young people to go that couldn't afford to go, you've made an investment in eternity. So Paul's trying to drive this point home to the church there in Corinth. And so they, they, he reminds them about this passion that others have had for giving. But that passion comes from the grace of God working in our hearts. And then their perspective. They had a perspective for giving. Oh, and by the way, too, that, that passion, where does it come from before we move on to the next point? Look, look what it says in verse 8. I speak not by commandment, Paul says, but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. So, I didn't say it, Paul's saying it. Financial giving proves your sincerity. It proves your love for Christ. It, it, it tells you about your relationship. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. The greatest investment that was ever made was when Jesus went to the cross and died for your sin and mine. He was investing his life that you might have eternal life. And so we do the same. So just ask yourself, what kind of, what is your 
attitude about giving. Do you have a passion for giving? Or are you always looking for excuses not to give? Because it demonstrates where's your heart at? Where's your heart at? So now we move on to the second point, their perspective for giving. And Paul writes, he says, the sub-point here is to finish a commitment. Insomuch, verse 6, he says, that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. So in other words, what was left unfinished? Well, like I said earlier, they made a promise to give. They haven't fulfilled the promise. He said, wait a minute, Paul said, you, you said earlier that you would help these churches and you didn't fulfill your promise. And uh, so he says, you need to finish this. And then also, if you notice in verse 10, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. In other words, this is for your benefit, who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. He's reminding them, a year ago. Verse 11, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. You said you would do it. And uh, what's happening here? You, you need to finish the commitment. And if we were to go back to 1 Chronicles, we would have read in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, where, where um, David says, we need to finish the work. To finish the work. And so there's still a work going on. There's still people who need to be saved. There's still lives that need to be changed. There's still churches that need to be established. There's still missionaries that need to go to the mission field. So it's incumbent upon you and upon me that we help finish the work. Amen? So that's what giving's about. But it's a matter of the heart. It's always a matter of the heart. Ephesians 4.28 on your handout. Let him that stole steal no more. Well, that's good advice, amen? <laughs> let him that stole steal no more. By the way, let me just say this, though. If we went back to Malachi, you know, he, you know what Malachi accuses the Israelites of? What? Yeah, he says, you're stealing from God. So we read this and we think sometimes, well, yeah, well, you shouldn't steal. You shouldn't go down to the 7-Eleven and, and uh, steal. Well, the reality is, as a believer, as we read God's word and we learn what God has to say, and when we don't fulfill, we don't perform the doing of it, just like the prophet Malachi said to the Israelites, you guys are thieves. Now, I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And so, um, just think of it that way. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. And now, look at the end of the verse. That he may have to give to them that needeth. From stealing to giving. One of the great examples in the Bible of that is a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he was a corrupt tax collector. And um, he, of course, you're, you all know the story. You know, Jesus met him, said, Zacchaeus, come down from going to your house today. But he was a thief. And the grace of God came upon him. And uh, God changed his life. He went from being a stealer to a giver. But that's the grace of God. And um, that's what Paul is writing to them here in Corinth. And the focus, as I've already mentioned, we'll just quickly, because I've said a few things about this, but the focus is on Christ. Again, verses 8 and 9. He's, he's drawing their focus to Christ. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. Where is your focus? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Where's your focus? If your focus is right, your finances are right. So Paul's saying. And so he says, get, make sure your focus is always on Christ. And then we move to the last point here, the performance in giving. Perform again, verse 11. Now, therefore, 
perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be performance also out of that which you have. And let's just stop there for a minute. A performance also out of that which you have. So you can't give what you don't have. I'll give you an example of what you shouldn't do. I was at a meeting in, in uh, New Hampshire, in a, at a church meeting there, with some really well-known preachers. And the man who pastored that church there, he was in a rented facility. And there was an old church building in that town, kind of like this. And they were trying to raise money to purchase that old building. So the pastor of that church in that meeting, he said, you know, he said, um, uh, as they were talking about it, trying to raise the money, and, and the, the three of the pastors there were very well-known pastors, came from very large churches, and truly could have helped finance that. But the pastor of that church, he said, you know, there's a guy in the church who's going to take out a credit card, and he's going to put $10,000 on the credit card to purchase this church, help purchase it. And I thought, is that really good stewardship of your money? To, to take a credit card to max it out for $10,000 to help purchase this church? You understand what I'm saying? It, it was this, the guy didn't really have the money, but he could get a credit card, put it on the credit card, and then he'd be paying like 21% interest on his credit card. Well, he wasn't required to do that, right? But, so you can only, you can, there used to be a saying, you can't outgive God. Right? Well, you can now give God if you don't have the money to give and God hasn't told you to give. Remember when I, we talked about greed? So sometimes motivation is, well, you can't out give God. So don't worry. If you give, God will bless and God will take care of you. Well, God told us also to be good stewards of the monies that we have. Are you following what I'm saying? All right. So Paul writes here and he says, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. So we go back to the, the woman who get put in her tomb. That's what she had. That's what she gave. Uh, there was others that had more, uh, and that's what they gave. But you can only give out of what you have. And that's the execution part of giving. But verse 12, but first, there has to be a willing mind. We talked about that. We looked... We looked at the willing mind comes from, it comes from God and the grace of God. It is accepted according to the man hath and not according to he hath not. And look at verse 13. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want and that their abundance also may be a supply for your want and that there may be an equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much hath nothing over, and he that hath gathered little hath no lack. So the execution of giving. There was a statistic I put, this is kind of, I thought this was kind of interesting in Time Magazine not too long ago. So they did a survey. And so in the state of Massachusetts, which is the fourth wealthiest state per capita in the country, it's also the stingiest, or one of the stingiest, Mississippi, uh, which is the 49th wealthiest, so it's a poor state, yet they're the second most generous in giving. That's kind of interesting. But it's the execution of it, and there's the equality of it. So when you give a percentage, that's the inequality. So in the Old Testament, the Bible teaches about tithing. We just read that. So just think about that. If people gave 10%, which is the tithe, whether you made $100 a week or $1,000 a week, if you tithed on that, the amounts are different, but the percentage is the same. Right? Right? Some of you are like, are, are you with me on this here? Yeah, nobody likes to respond to giving messages. But that's how it works. So Paul writes to them here and he says, listen, he says, everybody should just give equally. Don't expect, uh, don't expect to finance, the don't expect everybody else to finance the church. Let me put it in today's, 
the language. Don't expect everybody else to finance the church that you benefit from. Ooh. Right? Hey, don't get mad at me. Get mad at the Bible. <laughs> and uh, so Paul writes this here to them, and he talks about the performance of giving, this equality. Um, in fact, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He gives some instruction here. Now, he says, verse 1, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. He writes to them, he says, when you gather on the first day of the week, bring your offerings and give to the Lord. Pretty clear, right? It's not, don't need a doctorate in Christianity to, or in theology to understand what God's word is saying. So it's about just giving. It's how the local church is financed. It's how missions are financed. It's about giving. So he talks about make sure you do the performance of it. You know, this is what you're to do. And uh, it's not, he says, I don't mean that other men should be burdened and you eased, or, or, or other men be eased and you burdened. It's not like I'm putting a, it's not like I'm asking you to do something that I haven't been asking everybody else to do. There's an equality, he says in verse 14. And um, so he drives this point home. So as we finish up, given it's a matter of, it's a focus of our heart. Is your heart focused on Jesus? Well, in this particular scripture, Paul is saying, if your focus truly focuses truly on Jesus, then your giving will reflect that. So that's about as plain and simple as I can put it. It's not a have to. It should never be a have to. Giving should be, it's a want to. It's just motivated by the grace of God. Let me just finish again with verse 9. We'll have a word of prayer. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that, th that he through his poverty might be rich. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the greatest sacrifice of all, and that's the sacrifice when you went to the cross and died and paid for our sins. And Lord, Help us never to take for granted the salvation that we have through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us with regards to our finances to be mindful of the fact that uh, we're to be good stewards of these finances and that we're to give back to you what you have so graciously given to us. Help us to be cheerful in our giving. Help us to be grace-filled, abound in this grace, as your word says. Help, help us to be sensitive to the leading and to the guiding of the Holy Spirit and obedient to the scriptures. For your honor and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.